Good evening, and welcome again to Public Perspective. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. And if you follow the news, you know that health care is a top topic discussion right now in the political season. And we think of health care in very traditional terms, but there are other alternatives to health care that we can explore. Our guest tonight is Dr. Laureen Wu, a doctor of traditional Chinese medicine as well as an MD. And she's here to speak with us tonight about alternatives to what may be seen by most as traditional health care. Dr. Wu, so thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, let's start with some of the basics. Mm -hmm. um, you are an MD. I think everyone in our audience knows what an MD is and what kind of training you go through. But what is traditional Chinese medicine, or TCM, and what kind of, first of all, what is it? What kind of training do you have to go through? So give our audience some sense for, for uh, what makes you a doctor of TCM. Well, there are many pathways. The more traditional one in the United States, to uh, traditional Chinese medical school or better known as acupuncture schools and they are generally three to four year programs uh, where you learn acupuncture but more importantly you learn the philosophy of Chinese medicine which you, is more than just acupuncture right absolutely absolutely um, people think of acupuncture as Chinese medicine but actually Chinese medicine or TCM uh, is a broad topic and underneath are seven schools acupuncture being just one which is the um, application of sterile needles um, to elicit a hormonal or electromagnetic response but then you also have herbal therapy so it's ingestion of herbal preparations um, you have Twena which is its own school it's a combination of massage um, acupressure and chiropractic style adjustments in the United States, they're not doing the chiropractic adjustments, but they do the massage and the acupressure. And then um, th there are other schools such as um, nutrition, there's qigong, which is the breathing exercises, uh, slash martial arts. Um, there's also meditation. Uh, there's also feng shui, which is geomancy, the, the placement of objects. And then there's an astrology school. And what it's all designed to do is to facilitate the flow of chi or energy in a person. So you see it's all encompassing. All encompassing. Um, olden day Chinese doctors would go and literally arrange someone's home, look at their astrological charts, figure out when was the best time for them to get married. But more importantly, give them the right herbs and foods at the certain time of year, give them um, exercises, and if necessary, apply needles to facilitate the flow, all designed for the health of the person. Now, some portions of that, like for in particular, astrology is, has been largely discredited in, in the West. Mm -hmm. um, so is, is that still considered part of Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine, or that that no longer is something that's practiced here in the United States? Well, in the uh, Chinese medical schools in the United States, they may touch on it. It certainly isn't emphasized um, because of the connotation of it mm. being sort of voodoo medicine. Mm -hmm. However, um, I have studied with doctors who use it, and these are MDs also, but they've also gone on and done this mm -hmm. extensive, and TCM training can be extensive. Um, In fact, it's traditionally about as long as uh, MD training, is it not? Absolutely. In China, it's two uh, pathways. I mean, um, it's six years in China to, from beginning to end to be a, a medical doctor because they combine um, undergraduate college mm -hmm. education with a four-year graduate uh, medical school. But then the TCM path is the same thing. It's six years. Plus, then they do residencies. They have entire hospitals. And so um, what's fascinating is many of the MDs have to do some TCM training. And then likewise, uh, the TCM doctors, of course, have all the biomedical mm -hmm. training also. So in the United States, um, you have a lot of that biomedical training. So acupuncturists are trained in you know, uh, anatomy, physiology, and all of that also. Um, but, um, but back to the astrology question, um, but it can be very powerful. Um, they use it to place you within um, the context of your life. So the astrology supposedly can tell you, well, this is a good year for you, this is not a good year, and it helps the practitioner um, uh, uh, prepare the patient, if you will, um, help maybe strengthen them, give them some certain herbs to prepare for maybe a difficult year, or maybe back off in other years. Um, so it's fascinating. And then the astrology is also about timing. I mean, in ancient textbooks, they talked about acupuncture being done at certain times of the day is better for certain responses for that patient. So there was an acute awareness of the person the microcosm and the macrocosm and how they fit. A lot of that's been lost, though. Now, that's interesting because um, in, in, we've been looking recently at um, uh, 
chemotherapy for cancer. Right. And there is a school of thought on chemotherapy that talks about delivering it at certain times of day right. because your body is much more responsive to it. Mm -hmm. And I think we all know about the circadian rhythm and the body's right. cycles. So this is something that in traditional Chinese medicine, if I understand correctly, has been around for centuries or millennia perhaps. Right. Um, and that modern Western science is now sort of just discovering or rediscovering. Is that, mm -hmm. is that fair to say? Oh, absolutely. Um, well, it's, there are schools of even Western medicine that, that really take into account. Um, I mean, there's entire schools that study jet lag, if you will, mm -hmm. and, or the timing of medications. When's the best time to mm -hmm. take medications? But again, in terms of practical terms, most people don't use this knowledge. You know, you kind of take your medicine when you do. Um, but no, it, it, there is great power in paying attention to the time of day. Well, let's come back to something you said earlier as well, uh, something about the, uh, the macrocosm and, and the kind of whole life approach and the mm -hmm. fact that, in fact, your center is called the Whole Life Center. Right, right, yeah, right, in the Grand um, Park. Uh -huh. uh, and, and that the the uh, ancient doctors would come and, and help you arrange your furniture properly, arrange right. your house, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think what I have experienced of, of uh, traditional Chinese medicine is more of a, a of an approach to the whole person, mm -hmm. rather than um, in, in my uh, in my more skeptical moments with uh, in my <laughs> more skeptical experiences with Western medicine. Um, and I and I don't mean to disparage Western medicine. I've had you know I've had many good experiences with it as well. But I think. That there is a, a tendency to um, think of themselves, Western doctors, to think of themselves as as body mechanics. Mm -hmm. Like there's mm -hmm. something broken. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go in and fix whatever's broken. Mm -hmm. um, the way uh, an auto mechanic would not look at the engine if there's a problem with the the, the brakes, mm -hmm. right? But uh, in Chinese traditional Chinese medicine, it's all connected and all related. Is that mm -hmm. fair to say? Absolutely. There's a belief in the body's innate ability to heal and the power and the wisdom of the body. And that often it's the, 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 that energy, chi, if you will, is blocked and that we're trying to just restore that. And, and a lot of times, you know, all the herbs, acupuncture, are designed to kind of either build up the chi, open up the flow, uh, and that um, the body will take over and heal itself rather than, I mean, granted, you want really the best of both worlds. If you're in an accident, you want to go to the nearest, you know, Western <laughs> trauma hospital and right. have that surgery, right? But, um, but then for chronic conditions or even to heal from that surgery, then you want the TCM where they're teaching you, you know, um, ways to heal, truly heal. So for example, um, somebody with peptic ulcer disease, well, instead of giving them just a protein pump inhibitor, in Chinese medicine, you look at the root of their illness. So someone can come in with the same illness, but have six different approaches, you know, meaning um, somebody might be too hot and sweaty, and so they have a heat style ulcer. Other people may be just weak and deficient, so then they have like a spleen chi deficiency kind of ulcer, or et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's many um, and would, variations. In, in those examples you've just given, would, would traditional Western medicine treat those all as the same condition Absolutely. and with the same remedy. Right. But you would see that as many different types of conditions that would have different approaches. Right. right. So, so in treating the whole body, if somebody comes in, they might think, oh, I have these five separate conditions. But a TCM doctor would step back and say, what's common to all five? You know, somebody might have a lot of mucus in their body. So they come in and present with sinus problems and digestive issues and joint pain and, and foggy thinking, but they don't realize mucus could be at the root of all five or four or five issues. And then a TCM doctor might do acupuncture to clear it, herbs to clear it, tell you to get off a of dairy, you know, change your diet. Um, and those are usually the arenas we work in nowadays, we don't do as much with the feng shui, arranging the house mm -hmm. astrology and whatnot, even though some of the really skilled doctors have that. But it's the idea of let's treat the root and the cause of the condition, not just the symptoms that we see. And can this cause um, problems, uh, resistance from patients? So for example, if, if I were to come to you and I drink a lot and I smoke cigarettes and I hang out with my buddies and I go to the bar and this is my social life and my mm -hmm. life is built around that and all my buddies are there and, um, and I come to you and, and you say well you know you drink too much and you should give up smoking and you need to stop going to bars mm -hmm. um, and I would look at that and say well wait a minute you're you're asking me to give up the life that I know and, mm -hmm. and what's going on here mm -hmm. 
how, does that first of all does that happen and and how do you um, how do you handle those kinds of cases that's a great question because I encounter that frequently <laughs> and I think it's an education process you know that people may not think that those um, habits or um, you know choices make that much difference to their health but when you start to point out um, that it does and more importantly I try to create experiences where they experience it so I'll say well why don't you not drink for seven days and on the seventh day drink as much as you want and observe really what it's doing to you because a lot of people engage in habits on a regular basis mm -hmm. so they never get a, enough distance from it to really understand what it's doing to them and a lot of times when you actually demonstrate and physically show someone what's happening then that creates a lesson where they they're much more motivated to change um, however part of the problem in the West is we lead very stressful lives the pace of our life you know there's not enough room may I mean children have 20 minutes for lunch at school that's crazy there's not enough time for exercise relaxation mm -hmm. and so when people are stressed at that level they they're just looking for relief so a lot of these habits um, are just ways that people are relieving stress so then again educating people to just very slowly change one thing a week even you know maybe um, take a walk maybe meditate a little more maybe change a diet Terry, you know, f a favorite food item, and slowly feel better, and then it's easier to give up the habit. So it's not all or nothing. Right, but it's so it's a. I think the emphasis there is on the word slow. Mm -hmm. That that. Um, in fact, uh, I would think that someone who tried to go cold turkey and just change all this at once would probably run into a, a different series of problems that might make it impossible to do that. Is that is that likely that? Well, it depends on the motivation. So, for example, I work with a lot of cancer patients. Now, their motivation is very high. And most of those patients will just do a 180 and change every habit. I often encourage them to take a leave from work because to really care for yourself can be a 24-7 job. And in that scenario, it's fabulous because so much changes quickly. Of course, yes, there may be some detoxifying reactions. Mm -hmm. There may be things that... Um, as practitioners, we're going to help them with so that they're not overwhelmed by all of that, and you know you can slow down the pace somewhat. But in a perfect world, yes, to to just jump in is better. Okay. However, hmm. uh, taking into account human nature, you really look at each patient. Some people want to go, you know, 100%. Other people are like, whoa, 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 you know, I don't know if I can do it. And a lot of times, it's just trying to find out what is that, how is that person wired and trying to motivate them in the way that fits them. So um, if we think about habits, that's one thing, but the underlying stresses. So uh, how, does, how, how do you approach and how do your patients approach the kinds of changes that might alleviate that stress? Like n not everyone can quit their job, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Most people can't. Right. Right. Uh, so how do, you get, how do you get to the root of the problem and figure out what is this cause of stress? And, and, and if it may be something even that's you know, leftover baggage from 20 years ago or from right. high school, or who knows when. How do you work to get to that and those just really fundamental uh, psychological or emotional issues that may be tied in as well? Yeah, I mean, that's very important. And what, what creates one's response is multifactorial. I mean, number one is genetics, you know, congenital, what you inherit. So you, you may come from a family that responds in an anxious way. You may come from a family, and this is hardwired hard wired in, meaning you've inherited a certain chemical um, level in your brain chemistry, neurotransmitter level, so you just are more anxious, or some people are more easygoing or whatnot. So um, we have to take into account, you know, that factor, because if somebody is having trouble at their job and because of their genetics they're dealing in a more anxious way then we would help them with acupuncture that relieves anxiety we would help them with herbs that relieve anxiety to address the, the their constitution the way mm -hmm. they naturally would respond um, and then there are all the created imbalances from just life you know like you say from 20 years of living and, mm -hmm. and whatnot um, and then so there, there are many ways to address it. So then we might have specific lifestyle um, suggestions. You know, a TCM doctor will talk about how to talk to your boss. They'll talk about, you know, they'll, they'll help you with many, because um, all of it impacts your health. Everything that's ever happened to you um, is believed to be stored somewhere in your body in some kind of 
um, energetic memory. So you keep a history of every event. Somehow your body stores all of that and what what you are today at the, my age of 58 it, right. it is the culmination of 58 years worth of individual experiences and it's all stored somewhere and affects who I am and how I feel. That Absolutely and and so sometimes that serves us but a lot of times it's as you said baggage. So a lot of times we're doing acupuncture to release many of these because what happens is people end up like doing the fight or flight response mm -hmm. and they're tightening um, which is one of the most common syndromes all acupuncture see with something called liver chi stagnation we're just tight and then we we do acupuncture to release it or there's great herbs that release it so you may be in that same tough situation with a difficult ball, boss a, a difficult home life situation but your response may be very different because to respond when you're tight versus more open you'll say wow this is terrible but I'm, I'm going to deal with this versus what am I going to do? What am I do? I'm overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so that's how acupuncture helps. And so the environment may not change, but your internal response can change. So does it work? In fact, I just um, was watching a series of shows by Charlie Rose where he's talking about brain chemistry and Britain brain. Yeah. And, and one of the uh, top, uh, topics of discussion was serious clinical depression. Right. Um, and there's lots of new developments there in theory of the, the actual neural pathways and um, and how they, how they, uh, there's a lot of interrelation inter between the physical chemistry of the brain or the physical structure of the brain, the actual mm -hmm. neural network, um, and the life. There's so that psychotherapy and drugs are now seen as being complementary rather than, mm -hmm. than either or. Um, is this the kind of approach that, that you think is applicable in TCM? Is there a complement, a complementarity with Western medicine? You mentioned it briefly in terms of cancer treatment, for example. Um, and how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, you have the acupuncture world, and some people use that only because they choose not to use Western, or sometimes with like you broke your ankle, or you sprained your wrist, or whatever, you just need the acupuncture. But for well, chronic, I would, I would go for to get it set first, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Having exactly. broken a collarbone and having them surgically repaired it, I, I'm in favor of that. I, I, right, I thought right. that was a good solution to that problem. Right, exactly. I meant more for the swelling and pain mm, management yes, right. after they said it. But, um, but uh, for chronic conditions, absolutely. I mean, and what you really want to do is take the best of all worlds. So sometimes Western medicine and acupuncture, world, you know, they, they feel contentious, like it's either or. Absolutely not. You know, you want the best science, and, and there is definitely scientific background to um, Western medicine, but likewise in the acupuncture world, in TCM, there's thousands of journals published every month in China. There are whole acupuncture in TCM schools and whole um, networks of hospitals and residencies, everything supporting this. So there's a lot of science for both. So when, when you see a patient, let's say, let's take the uh, subject of um, cancer or depression, um, well, let's say cancer. So someone comes in and you're doing Western diagnosis, maybe surgery, maybe chemo, maybe radiation, but you're using lots of um, herbs to support them at different stages, or maybe during chemo it's so toxic, so you're not using as many herbs, but you're more using more acupuncture to support them. So I've had many patients go through radiation chemo and not miss a day of work, and they you know have good energy, good mood. You know we've you know you can really minimize the side effects. Mm -hmm. So particularly, I think in the area of um, cancer, because chemotherapy is so toxic, and it, mm -hmm. uh, the, I guess it's the joke or the standard thinking is that it's, it's essentially a, a serious poison, but it also happens to have the side effect of killing your cancer cells, mm -hmm. right? So th you are essentially poisoning your body with that the chemotherapy, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. is that a major thrust then of the TCM approach to, to a cancer patient is to help alleviate that toxicity? Um, and, and, and what, here's the, the real question. I would assume that that's true, but how would acupuncture, for example, reduce the toxicity of a chemical? What it does is it strengthens the person's innate ability to detoxify themselves. So mm. for example, um, you know, your major detoxifying organs are your liver, your kidney, your skin, your lungs, you know. And so we, we would strengthen the immune system of the person because really fundamentally cancer is an immune dysfunction. We all have cancer cells, but some people's immune system because of life, because of genetics, whatever, 
couldn't mount the response to that challenge. And so what we do is we stimulate the person's immune system to be able to. Then we combine it. See, as an integrative physician, you know, doing acupuncture, mm -hmm. TCM, but I'm also doing functional medicine, environmental medicine, whatever. So then I might talk to that patient also about inflammation and how to change their diet and how to use green drinks and, you know, spirulina, chlorella and, you know, green powders. And so, so you can use so many things and combine it together for the best for that patient. Let's talk for a minute about diet since you brought it up. Uh -huh. um, and the, uh, the standard American diet of uh, pizza and beer and, and McDonald's mm -hmm. and whatever you can grab on the run. Yeah. Another function, I think, of the high pace of right. modern life. Right. Um, what is that doing to most of us? Oh, well, I mean, when you think about it, we as a plant, needs, we need nourishment. And mo most of that have absolutely no nourishment. So we are... Now, you say absolutely no nourishment. I mean, if I go to McDonald's and have a quarter pounder... Okay. Um, I, 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 I overspoke by saying absolutely none, but given per calorie, you really want nutrient-dense calories. So if you're going to take in a calorie, you want it to count. Right. And the problem with that is you can take in 2,000 calories, it's delicious, it's, you know, like... It's got well, everything you want, fat, salt, salt sugar. Salt, whatever. Right. When I say delicious, that's relative, but right. I don't mean it's, you know... But those, we, I think, uh, someone else I know who was going through a, a radical reshaping of her diet right. um, has talked about her own addiction, and yeah. she felt that she was addicted to fat, salt, and right. sugar. Right, right. Um, but, and less so sugar, actually more fat and salt and... Yeah. and and pasta, right, <laughs> which right, is right. like it turns into sugar pretty quickly. Um, so these are, the, they do uh, develop, you do develop a, an addiction to it. But, but I'm sorry, I, I, I want to come back to the idea of, of nutrient-dense calories, because I think that's an important concept that most Americans don't understand. Well, because most people are really malnourished and thus obese, because now, you never get enough, you just, you're constantly hungry. Right, but if you eat, like I tell patients to eat for color, you're, you're, you're eating vegetables that are orange and yellow and red and blue and purple. That's, you know, your mm -hmm. eggplants or your beets and, you mm -hmm. know, all of that. Every color is a different mineral. You know, orange is your beta carotene, red is your lycopene, you know, green is your chlorophyll. You're getting nutrients. And when you eat like that, you're satisfied on some deep level. And so when you're eating McDonald's, yeah, it might satisfy the craving for salt and whatnot, but it may not be filling all those nutrients that your body's craving all the you know nutrient requirements and when you don't fill them then you're just constantly low level hunger and and then you just overeat and and there's the problem and i will say from my own experience and, and uh, even though i try not to do this <laughs> and, and now in my current life but i can remember going to mcdonald's and the first thing i would think when i left was gee i gotta get something to eat right right yeah. right well, because some of the foods, again, and this is a whole other subject, if you look at glycemic index and blood sugar management and whatever, a lot of these foods are um, soaked in sugars and coated in fat and salt, so they elicit this, like, insatiable desire. I mm -hmm. mean, some of it, quite frankly, may be manipulated, you know. And so, um, and because of that, um, we don't realize that we aren't always in control of um, how we respond. And I always tell patients, we are like a black box. How you, your craving here was created by you eating or doing something here. And if you want to change this craving, you change something here. So in order not to be hungry after McDonald's, you eat a home-cooked meal that has all... All those different colors in it. Right. right. And the fat, salt, and sugar, well, sugar is a whole other subject, but the fat and salt is not necessarily bad. We need healthy fats for every cell membrane in our body. So healthy fats are like olives, avocados, and, and you know healthy oils like olive oil, coconut oil. We need that. If you get enough of that, you won't be craving the French fries mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. And we need salt. You know, we, we need salt for proper water metabolism and, and other processes. We, we just don't need too much salt. And we get kind of numb and um, numbed out by how much salt we eat. But, um, yeah. So uh, the, one of the things that I think that uh, is... There are lots of misunderstandings about al alternative health approaches, and, and one of them is that if I, if I were going to follow this regimen, I would have to become a vegetarian or a vegan, right. and that's right. not necessarily true, is no, it? No, no. You really want to look at the person. Some people would do great, the most extreme, would be like raw vegan. They just feel fabulous. They lose 30, 50 pounds. Great. 
but other people, it would not fit them because their body needs something else. So they may need to eat meat, but you're trying to find grass-fed, hormone-free meat. You're trying to, you know, eat enough greens and vegetables so it's alkalizing to offset the acidity of the meat. So in other words, if you're going to eat meat, you balance it in a way that's healthy. So the bottom line is everyone's an individual, and, and you just got to study them and figure out what's best for them. Well, and I think that's a key point that I would like to spend a little time looking, even though we're, we only got a few minutes left. Okay. Um, uh, but the, the individualized approach, mm -hmm. and I think in my own experience with uh, Western medicine, the large hospital, particularly here in Chicago, um, I, I think of them almost as medical factories. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, one size fits all. Oh, you have X, therefore we're going to give you Y. Right. Uh, and, and what I'm hearing from you is a very different approach, mm -hmm. one that really focuses on the individual. And how important is that? Oh, I think that's key. It's absolutely essential. And that is the power of TCM, is that they're looking at you individually and trying to get at the root of your illness, not just the symptoms, and then placing you in the context of where you live. You know, city versus rural, lots of people around you versus your isolate, you know, and the context of your life. Because to just treat you as an isolated person um, is not always not only useful but not even effective. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've also heard it said about um, TCM that it's 80% uh, talking and 20% <laughs> and, and doing. Uh, and, and so what, what's happening there in, the, in that talking portion? Well as in Western medicine also you know when I was in medical school many many years ago the, we were taught the history and physical should give you the diagnosis you know 80% of the diagnosis should be from the history of physical alone. But we've lost that in our rush to MRIs and CT mm -hmm. scans and whatnot. So in TCM, you're sitting and you're studying. Like, you know, I've already been studying you the whole time <laughs> we've been talking. You know, we're looking yeah. at the texture of your skin, the tone of your voice, you know, your body position, what kind of energy are you conveying, you know, all of that is really important. And then, and then you're listening to what they're saying. Not only how, what they're saying, but how they're saying, the emotion behind it, and, and really with sitting with someone, you can learn a tremendous amount. The, the keys to their healing is, they, most patients hold the keys to their healing. It just takes someone to really look at them and, and listen to figure out what that key is. And so um, we only have like a minute left. Sure. So, um, talk about that key and how do, how do people find that key or how do you help them find that key or those keys? You mean the patients yes. find it for themselves? Yes, exactly. Oh, absolutely. I think it's to take real responsibility. It's not to blame your genes. It's not to blame your parents. It's or not to blame or, your yeah. boss, your environment, whatever, to say, but to, just to start and say, what one small thing can I do today? And what's happening, we're almost like well, bogged actually, down. Uh -huh. With that comment, mm -hmm. we're out of time. Okay, So we'll take that you. one thing. What can I do today? Right. right. So, mm -hmm. Dr. Wu, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm always enlightened when I speak to you. So, mm -hmm. um, we'll have you back again. Okay, thanks for inviting me. Thank you. And thank you for joining us once again for Public Perspective. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. You can find us on Comcast Channel 19 every Saturday night at 8. And you can also find us on the web at publicperspective.tv. Till next time, thank you and good night.